Hey, um, Tommy and Gina Rourke from New York are in the house, right? Where's Tommy and Gina? Oh, there they are, right there. Um, you know, Tommy and Gina have been to like our conferences and they're like the most faithful people each, each week. So we like talk on Chew the Fat, which by the way, you can be a part of if you want to, where we talk about the sermon and stuff on Tuesday nights at six o'clock, okay? So anyway, um, extra brownie points in heaven if you hug Tommy and Gina after the service, right? Okay, let's pray. So Father, um, I pray that you would help us, help me in particular, not to lie about you. It seems incredibly strange that you ask us to even talk about you. And so, um, Lord, I thank you for your spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would really uh, do the talking and that you would provide uh, sacred filters for the ears of everyone in the room if I uh, say something that's not true about you. But, God, I thank you that you like to speak through earthen vessels like us. So, I pray that we would speak your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I think this, I want to show you this, I think this is my favorite Christmas present ever. Um, this is a picture that I took of my, of my four kids that uh, one Christmas Susan and the kids put in this little frame from Target for probably like five dollars and it sits, uh, sits on my shelf in the office here when you walk in or sometimes at home on my desk where I can stare at it all the time. Took the picture about 26 years ago. Fathers put stuff like this on their desks uh, to fill them with hope and to remind them what it's uh, all about. These are my kids. Each one of them is like a, a, deep, a deep well. This picture holds, holds my heart. Jonathan, my firstborn, is on the right. No words can fully describe Jonathan. Jonathan feels things very deeply. That can be a trap within oneself, or that can cause you to hang on a cross for, for others. Jonathan was our youth pastor, you know, here at the church for a couple of years. Now he's a counselor in Seattle, where he works primarily with the indigent population of downtown Seattle. Elizabeth is our second. Uh, even in this picture, you can see that she's telling me what to do. Every night when she was little, no lie, she would pray this prayer. She always prayed the same prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that I know everything in the world. Amen. Elizabeth is strong-willed, and that's terrifying if that will is turned inward, and yet it's the very image of Jesus when it's directed at others, and that's Elizabeth. Elizabeth is, I think, one of the kindest people that I know. Next month, she's moving home from Chile. Uh, a few months later, her husband Francisco is following her where they will live in our newly finished basement. Rebecca, or Becky, is there in the center. You remember that Isaac met Rebecca by a well, and that's Becky, centered and deep. Becky has a deep concern for justice. Uh, that can become a dungeon of self-pity, or it can become a fountain of compassion and salvation when it's focused on, on, on others. One night around Christmas when she was about this age, she put my, I was, um, I was just so stressed, Christmas time, I remember I went to say goodnight, she put my head on her lap and she said, um, you be the little baby and I'll be the mommy. And she patted my, and my heart just rested in uh, her love. Becky's the one who got in the little boy's face, I told you about this a little while ago, got in the little boy's face at, at Elitch's and pretended to shoot me with a toy gun. She got in his face, she said, please don't shoot my daddy. He's the only one we've got and we love him very much. Becky's the friend you want when the whole world is shooting you down. Coleman is the youngest being cared for in this picture by his older counsel brother, Jonathan, while Elizabeth tells me what to do and Becky is lost in her own world with a stuffed elephant. Coleman may be the toughest person I know. He's the one that fell off the cliff like 70 feet in Utah last summer. When Coleman was little, he was nearly impossible to discipline. I mean, it was impossible to hurt him. He had like a Teflon behind. I, I don't know what was going on there, but Coleman's a warrior, which of course is wonderful as long as you're uh, involved in the right war. Coleman's newly married, working on a PhD in geology. I think he wants to be a dad. I'm convinced that Coleman would die for me if need be. 
and not even think twice about it. He's, he's a warrior with a very tender heart. This is a, a picture of the four kids on vacation about 12 years ago in Glenwood Canyon. This is the last picture that I have of all of us together in one place. We took this in the parking lot at the a lodge near Grand Canyon at Coleman's wedding a couple days, or the morning after he was, was married. Well, when I see them in a picture like this, or even in a picture like this, I also see them like this. You understand? For the people in this picture, no matter what they've achieved, no matter what they haven't achieved, no matter what they've done, no matter what they have not done, I know that buried beneath all of that history is a miracle, a priceless miracle that I've come to believe is the very breath of the living God. To be honest, I have kind of a hard time looking at this picture because it feels as if my heart is going to beat right out of my chest. I mean, I have a difficult time handling all the emotions, the passion. It's overwhelming. But I don't think that you have to be a mother or a father to feel these feelings. You just have to hang around a little child for a long time and watch them become what we would call an adult. As toddlers, they can be really terrible at times, but also so delightful because for them, everything is delightful. And oddly enough, they're unaware of how delightful, how beautiful, how good they themselves actually are. But then a day comes. A day comes when they become aware of their own beauty. They gain the knowledge of good and evil. They become self-conscious. So instead of simply being good, they try to make themselves good, and ironically, that can make them quite bad, <laughs> even evil. I mean, if you're a parent, you probably remember an age at which your child stopped simply expressing themselves and felt the need to prove themselves. It's the age at which they get trapped within themselves and become more like a well and less like a fountain. It's the age at which they begin to doubt your love. It's the age at which they begin to compare and compete one with the other. It's the age at which they begin to be tempted to exalt themselves by humiliating somebody else. It's the age at which they start to wonder, Daddy, do you, do you love John more than me? Elizabeth more than me? Becky more than me? Do you, do you love Coleman? I mean, they, they don't necessarily say this out loud, but they wonder it inside. Do you love Coleman more than me? And this is the really weird thing about being a father. When I reflect on it, I really don't know that I can love one more than the other. Each is utterly unique, and I, I don't want any one of them to be exactly like one of the others. I'm saying each one is different, but I love each one the same amount. And that's with all that I have and all that I am. Weirder still, if at a particular time I do feel more love for one than for another, it's usually when that one is hurting more than the others. And usually that hurt is self-inflicted. It's when they've trapped themselves in dungeons of self-pity, shame, and fear. It's then that I most want to find them there and go sit with them there, there in the dark at the bottom of their well. And weirder still, when they share those dark places, pits, and dungeons with me, I'm deeply grateful. And then those dry wells are often transformed into fountains of living water. The stories are just, you know, too personal to tell in a place like this. But I think you know what I mean. 
is pretty much what every movie ever made is all about. It's the miracle of grace. Love suddenly welling up from a broken heart in a dry place like a fountain. A fountain that becomes a river, a river of life. Now there are those that would say to a father, that's dangerous. That's weak. In fact, that makes you a bad father. It means that your children can just sin and your grace will abound all the more. It means they have, they have, well, they have power. You give them power. You give them power to like nail your heart to a tree and walk away. It means that they have no need to fear you. And now this is the place where it really gets weirdest of all. In one sense, the people in this picture need to fear me more than anyone else in all the world. And why is that? It's because I will not leave them alone. If one of their friends decide to destroy their own life, I'll say, oh, gee, honey, that's too bad. Let's say a prayer for them. But if they decide to despise themselves, seek to destroy themselves, I will do everything in my power to violate their judgment and make them believe my judgment. And that is that they are the pinnacle of God's creation. If you harm one of the people in this picture, I'll become enraged. And I'll have to remind myself that you are in someone else's picture. And if the people in this picture harm each other, oh gosh, I will be even more enraged. And yet that rage will just like rip my heart in two. Why? Well, because, like I said, they're my heart. But if the people in this picture love each other, I'm saved. Dad is saved. You see, as long as they're torn apart, I'm torn apart. And as long as any one of them sits alone in hell, well, I also sit alone in hell with them. I'm saying that even though I'm a delinquent, insufficient, deeply flawed father, I cannot not love the people in this picture. And it is not like that for me with anyone else. But it is like that for me with the people in this picture, in this picture. And now for some of you, it feels like I'm sticking a knife in your heart. Because you're thinking, I wish I was in a picture, in a frame, on the desk of my father. Well, you are. John chapter four, verse three. We preached on this passage last week and we focused on the topic of worship. This week we're gonna focus on a, a different topic, but I hope you remember absolutely everything that we said last week right now, okay? John chapter four, verse three. Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee and he, pa- and he, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, literally drunk, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you got nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? She claims that that Jacob, that is Israel, you know, Israel and Jacob are the same person. She claims that, that Israel is the father of the Samaritans. And Jesus is a Jew, and he doesn't argue with her. She says, Jacob gave us the well. 
and drank from it himself and did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Normally water goes down our gullet and into our belly and sits there like, like a well, but Jesus promises to reverse the flow. Give her water from inside the temple of her own soul that, that turns a well into a fountain. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go. Go, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have five husbands and the one you are now with, number six, is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here. That would be the seventh hour when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him, the, the Father. Do you notice that Jesus keeps saying, the Father? As if there's just one Father. And did you notice that he's saying it to a Samaritan, an estranged, sinful, female Samaritan? We miss all this today, but you can get the gist of it by just substituting the most derogatory descriptor that you can imagine in place of the word Samaritan. We miss the animosity behind these words. We also miss all the references that a Jewish student of Scripture would have picked up in just just an instant. We can read about all these references. Okay, you can do this tonight in Genesis 33 through Genesis 50. They involve the city of Shechem called Shikar or Sikar, drunk town by the Jews in Jesus' day. The city of Shechem and an amazing story of how Jacob acquires the land there shortly after he wrestles the God man at the river. He, he buys land and then he takes more land in war for Jacob's sons tell the prince of Shechem that he can marry their sister if the city is circumcised. And then on the third day, when the warriors of Shechem are, quote, sore, the sons of Israel, sons of Jacob attack, kill them all as punishment for violating their sister Dinah. In other words, this is not a, this is not a boring story. And then we read about Joseph, the youngest of the brothers and Jacob's favorite. You remember that jo Joseph was sent by Jacob to find his brothers herding his father's flock near Shechem. And jealous of Joseph, the brothers throw Joseph in a well, a dry well. It's Judah that comes up with the idea of selling Joseph into slavery in Egypt. The Samaritan woman is almost certainly of the tribe of Ephraim or Manasseh, she's almost certainly a descendant of Joseph. And Jesus is the king of the Jews, as in Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and they're sitting by a well which Jacob gave to Joseph before he died. This story is like dripping with irony and, and intrigue and paradox and super duper double irony. That's the technical term that you learn in seminary. Well, about a thousand years after Joseph is thrown in the pit and then saves all of his brothers from famine, David, his senate of Judah, becomes king of all Israel. For the 12 brothers have now become a great nation. But soon after, 10 tribes separate and become the northern kingdom that is now called Israel and, and, and are led primarily by the descendants of Joseph, the northern kingdom. They separate from the two tribes to the south that now comprise a southern kingdom called Judah. They divide and, and they battle each other for like 200 years until in 722 BC, the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrians and all its leading citizens are taken captive, never to return. They could be you. They've long since been mixed into the genetic stock of Europe and Asia. 
But some of the common folk remain in the land and over time intermarry with others. To this day, you can still find these people on Mount Gerizim over in Palestine. To this day, they're known as the Samaritans. 150 years later, 586 B.C., the southern kingdom of Judah also falls. Its leading citizens are also taken into captivity in Babylon, and yet they return 48 years later under Cyrus. Uh, to this day, they're known as the Jews. But ironically, they're not actually Israel, or all of Israel, I should say, and God's promise of return is to all Israel. That's all Israel, including the dead, the dry bones buried in the depths of the pit. And my point is that the whole Bible is like this outrageous family drama and now Jesus is acting like this despised, estranged Samaritan woman belongs in the picture on the Father's desk. And of course she does. She's like the great, 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 great granddaughter of Joseph. But now this is what's utterly scandalous about Jesus. He not only acts as if the hated Samaritans belong in the picture on the Father's desk. Jesus acts as if everyone that's anyone is already in the picture on the Father's desk. Not just Judah, but Joseph. Not just Jacob, but Esau. Not just Isaac, but Ishmael. Not just Abel, but Cain. <laughs> Not just Jesus, but you. Jesus believes there is one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and through all, as St. Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4. And so when Paul speaks of adoption, huyothesia, literally to place his son, he's not saying that God at one time was not your father. He's saying that at one time, God, your father, did something so that you would believe he is your father and you are his beloved son or his beloved daughter. And what God did was send the spirit of his only begotten son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, Dad. In the previous chapter of John, Jesus refers to himself as the only begotten son of God. Right after he tells Nicodemus that we must be begotten of the Spirit, begotten from above, which clearly implies that not only is God our Father, but we, almost be the, we must also be the very body of God the Son, which means God is our Father just as God is Jesus' Father. And Jesus makes this all just abundantly clear when he commands us and a crowd of non-Christians on a hillside to simply pray, Our Father. The Father of Jesus is your Father. And when you say, Daddy, Father, it is the Spirit of Jesus given to you from behind a veil in the temple of your soul that is now rising up your windpipe and doing the talking. Now, some, some people will say, hey, in just four chapters, John chapter 8, Jesus will say to some people, you are of your father the devil. And that's true. But who are those people? They are, quote, verse 48, the Jews. That's the Judeans from the tribe of Judah. They are the Jews, and they are, quote, verse 44, a lie. For after Jesus says their father is the devil, he immediately says the devil is the father of lies. The devil cannot father real people. The devil can only father false people, people that might act very, very religious but believe that they have created themselves and thus have no father. The Judeans then say to Jesus, are we not right, Jesus, in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Do you remember what Jesus responds? Well, I don't have a demon. 
He implies, the king of Judah, that he's a, a Samaritan. In the story of the Good Samaritan, he even casts himself as the Samaritan. And then the challenging question that we all miss at the end of the story is, would you allow yourself to be saved if your Savior was, in fact, a Samaritan? You see, Jesus reveals that the line separating good and evil does not run between groups of people, like races, classes, genders, even orientations. The line between good and evil runs through every human heart. It runs between the part of you that St. Paul calls the old Adam or the false self and that part of you that Paul calls the new Adam or the new self. The false self assumes that it has created itself. And the true self trusts that it is the beloved creation of God, our Father. The true self believes he or she is chosen. And you see, that is what's so utterly insulting about fathers. You don't choose them. Whether they're aware of it at the time or not, they chose you. My point is that to this estranged, reviled Samaritan woman, Jesus reveals that she is in the picture on the Father's desk. And, and because he reveals this in the very place where she knows the most failure, in the very place she feels the most shame, her well just like suddenly turns into a fountain. She knows she didn't choose, but she is chosen by grace, through faith. And this whole thing not of herself. She is one of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and she's just been found. She is Jesus' long lost sister with the very same father, not just Jacob, but God. She is the bride of Christ, who is the seventh man, the eschatos Adam. She is so in the picture. She is so in the picture, she even gives birth to the picture. She is the bride of Christ, and she is also his mother. And now this is where it really, really, really gets wild. But, but you check this out. Very rarely does Jesus refer to himself as the Son of God in the Gospels. Only once does he say so directly. But 81 times he refers to himself as the Son of Man. If God is his father, who is his mother? Son of God and Son of Man as in humanity. Jesus was in Joseph in the bottom of the well, and then saving all of Israel. Jesus is now in the Samaritan woman, trusting our Father. Jesus in you really is righteousness in you, which is a good decision in you. You see, your true self is somehow Christ's self being formed within you. That's what Paul says, oh, I'm in travail until Christ would be formed within you. Your true self is Christ's self being formed in you. It's the you that believes you are a beloved child of God. But your false self believes that you have created yourself. In other words, it believes that you are a bastard. And now if that word just like stuck in you like a knife, listen very closely. The false self is the self that believes the lie. And it is a lie because that is not what you are or who you are. Anyway, in the place where she had believed the lie, the Samaritan woman now receives the word of God, who is Jesus. And what's happened? She gives birth to the word of God, who is Jesus. She was a well, and she turns into a fountain. She worships in spirit and truth. That was last week's message. And she is the world's very first evangelist. This week's message. Verse 23, the hour is coming and is now here, says Jesus, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father, the Father is seeking that kind of person, such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, literally, I am the one who is speaking to you. 
Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water, she left her water jar, went into the town, and said to the people, um, the people, by the way, who had rejected her, right? We talked about that last week. She said to them, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. She doesn't hide her failure. She advertises her failure and the fact that Jesus knows all of her failures. Come see the man that told me all I ever did. No, he couldn't have, in our way of thinking, told her everything that she ever did, and yet he did reveal the reason for everything that she ever did. She was thirsty for the word of love that comes from the Father. Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I got food that you do not know about. Perhaps he's nourished by nourishing her with himself. What a, what a thought. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish, to lay, to lay ao, finish, as in it is finished, to accomplish his work. Do you not say that? yet four months then comes the harvest well look I tell you lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest and now pay attention they're standing in Samaria looking at Samaritans the harvest of the earth is faith and mercy it's it's bread and wine it's the life of Christ manifest in the body of Christ in Samaria? In Samaria, they can believe that they're created, saved, and sanctified by God. But in Judah, they believe that they have created, saved, and sanctified themselves. In other words, they think they've chosen God. And so they cannot be chosen by God, in other words, children, in the picture on the Father's desk. Verse 36, already the one who reaps is receiving wages, says Jesus, and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper, and Jesus is the reaper in the Revelation, you know, so the sower and the reaper may rejoice together, for here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world not some of the world the world so like I said this Samaritan is the world's very first evangelist you know in Judah you check this out Jesus will still command the folks to keep his identity a secret but in Samaria, they're ready for the good news. You see, some people think that the good news is bad news if it means that people that they like to judge are also in the picture on the Father's desk. But in Samaria, they've been to the bottom of well, and now they're totally cool with Jesus being the savior of the world, the, the whole world. To them, that's good news. Euangelia is Greek for good news. It's also where we get our English word evangelism. Ugh. I think I used to hate doing evangelism because I was beginning to realize that the so-called news was bad. And not even news, but something more like a bribe or a threat. I think I also felt that when I shared this so-called good news, I was actually lying about God and about the people I was speaking to and about myself. I have been trained to, to tell people that they were not in the picture on the Father's desk. And so they were subject to the Father's endless wrath, unless, of course, they trusted my word and made a choice 
that would land them a place in the picture and so save them from God. Take my knowledge and so save yourself from God. Do you hear the lie? You can save yourself from God by trusting my word and making your choice. But the gospel is God saves you from your choice. Sin. The gospel is God saves you from yourself by sending his word that you have been chosen from the foundation of the world by God, your father. In other words, you are in a picture sitting on our father's desk. Good news. Jesus finishes the word of God by causing us to trust our Father. He finishes the work of God by delivering up his spirit on the sixth day of creation, sixth day of the week, or on the sixth hour of the day. That's the spirit that meets you in the dust and ashes at the bottom of your well and cries out, Abba, Father, Dad. <laughs> now we're out of time. And I wanted to talk about racism, social justice, most of all, principles of evangelism all derived from this text, but I don't think any of that is really necessary. It's not necessary if only we would learn to see the people around us, people we like and people we don't like, black people, white people, gay people, straight people, Arab people, Jewish people, female people, male people, religious people, and even satanic occult Nazi people. Uh, we don't need the list. The list is not necessary if only we begin to see the people around us as people in the picture sitting on the Father's desk. It's not necessary if we would just get the picture. And now before we end, check this out. I love evangelism. I really, I really think I, I do now. I mean, this has surprised me, but I like to sit next to people on planes that are stuck in their seat and they cannot run away from me. People who think that God hates them. People that think they have just failed, you know, one too many times. People who think that God could never forgive someone on their sixth marriage or sixth abortion or sixth indictment on the sixth day at the sixth hour. I love to sit next to people like that and say, hey, our father, your dad and my dad, he's got a picture on his desk. And you're in it. And could I just tell you why I think that's true? And then I usually tell them about the time that God revealed the reason for everything I've done. I tell them about the time he showed me how I had gone into the ministry because I hated the church. I tell them about my sin. And then I like to tell him about how in that very place, that very same day, God revealed to me that he had always been and would always be everywhere, always loving me, absolutely. I tell them about the Father's relentless love in a word, grace. And this is the crazy thing. <laughs> I mean, I had to think about this a while, but I don't do it because I have to. I do it because like in that moment, I just really, really want to. I mean, I'm less like a well and I'm more like a, a fountain. Just won't shut up. A few years ago, a Gallup poll asked Americans what they most wanted to hear. These were the top three answers. Number one, I love you. Number two, I forgive you. Number three, it's time for dinner. I can still hear four little voices running through my house after a day of hopes and fears, failures and successes, laughters and sorrows. I can still hear them running through the house and screaming at the top of their lungs, Daddy's home! Time for dinner! And now, that's your job. For on the night, that the word of our Father was betrayed by all of us. 
He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. All 12 of you. It's time for dinner. And so in other words, and by way of benediction, believe the gospel and you will become the gospel. And for you, that might look like a cup of cold water given to a child. It might look like expositing the book of Romans in a sermon series on Sunday mornings. It might look like dancing in your underwear under the moon, praising God in the forest all alone. It might look like suffering patiently, but it will be the word of the Father rising up like a fountain from deep within you and giving life to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.